This program is made possible through the generosity of the Code of the West Foundation, believing in a set of common sense values, working for what you get, helping your neighbors, taking care of your family, and having your handshake and word be your bond. Welcome to Cowboy, the legend, the legacy. I'm Red Stegall. These are the boys in the bunkhouse, and shortly we'll be joined by a great lady and a very special friend, Miss Reba McIntyre. <laughs> We're going to celebrate the life of the working cowboy in song, poetry, and story. The cowboy that we celebrate is not the two-fisted gunslinger of the movies, but rather the honest, hard-working family man who makes his living a horseback providing beef for the dinner tables of America. We'll also celebrate the life of the hardy pioneer woman who held the West together with her grit, determination, and faith. There are several things about the cowboy that fascinate us. First is the romance of the lifestyle. And Hollywood helped us out on the romance by capitalizing on stories of the trail drives from the South Texas brush to the Kansas railheads. The trail drives only lasted 20 years but the images are very vivid in our minds. And although all the Hollywood images are not true, the ones of independence, individualism, and freedom appeal to folks in all walks of life. Now, Hollywood did show us the difference between right and wrong. For two generations, we were taught that there was a definite line between right and wrong. There was no gray area. It was one way or the other. The good guys wore white hats and the bad guys wore black hats. And I think it's kind of sad that today our society condones the wearing of gray hats. It's getting harder and harder for our children to know where the line is. The values of honesty, integrity, loyalty, honor, dedication to family, and conviction about his beliefs are the cornerstone of the cowboy way of life and should apply to everyone, regardless of where they live, and what they do for a living. As my dear friend Baxter Black says, cowboy is alive and well. You just can't see him from the freeway. A lot of folks think it's all over. The cowboy has outlived his time. An old worn out relic, a thing of the past. The truth is, he's still in his prime. The cowboy is the image of freedom, the hard riding boss of the range. His trade is a fair one, he fights for what's right, and his ethics aren't subject to change. He still tips his hat to the ladies and lets you water first at the pond. He believes a day's pay is worth a day's work, and his handshake and word are his bond. <laughs> and you know, work ethic is either learned by example or by experience. Here's a poem that I wrote about a couple of childhood experiences that really made an impression on me. We picked up all the fencing tools and staples off the road. An extra roll of barbed wire was the last thing left to load and I drew a sleeve across my face to wipe away the dirt and the young man who was helping me was tucking in his shirt. I turned around to him and said, this fence is finally done. Five new strands of barbed wire shining proudly in the sun. And the wire, it's running straight and tight with every post in line. The kind of job you're proud of, one that stands the test of time. The kid was not impressed at all. Just stared off into space. Reminded me of years ago, another time and place when I called myself a cowboy. I was full of buck and ball. And I didn't think my hands would fit post augers in a mall. But they sent me out with Shorty and the ranch fence building crew. Oh, I was quite insulted. And before the day was through, I let him know that I'm a cowboy. This ain't what I do. I ain't no dead gun nester I hired out to buckaroo. He said, we'll talk about that, son, when we get in tonight. But 
Right now, you pick them augers up. It's either that or fight. Boy, I was digging post holes faster than a Georgia mole. But if a rock got in my way, I simply moved the hole. So when the cowboys set the post, the line went in and out, and old Shorty's face got fiery red, and I can hear him shout, Nobody but a fool would build a fence that isn't straight. And I got no use for someone who ain't pulling his own weight. Well, I thought for sure he had hit me. Glad he didn't have a gun. I turned around to find a place where I could duck and run, but Shorty walked up to me just as calm as he could be. Said, son, I need to talk to you. Let's find ourselves a tree. Well, he rolled a Bull Durham cigarette as we sat on the ground, took himself a puff or two, then slowly looked around. Son, I ain't much on schooling. Didn't get too far with that. But there's a lot of learning hidden underneath this hat. And I got it all the hard way, every bump and bruise and fall. Sure, some of it was easy. Son, most weren't fun at all. But one thing that I always got from every job I have done is do the best I can each day and try to make it fun. And I know that busting through them rocks ain't what you like to do, but getting mad, you've made it tough on me and all the crew. Sure, you hired out the cowboy. You think you got the stuff, and you've told him you're a good hand, and the boss has called your bluff. So how's that going to make you look when he comes riding through and he asks me, who dug them holes? And I say it was you. Sure, we could let it go like this and take the easy route, but doing things the easy way ain't what it's all about. The boss expects a job well done from every man he's hired. He lets you slide by once or twice. Then one day, you'll get fired. If you're not proud of what you do, you won't amount to much. You'll bounce around from job to job just slightly out of touch. Come morning, let's redig those holes and get that fence in line. And you and I will save two jobs, those being yours and mine. And someday you'll come riding through. You'll look across this land See a fence that's laid out straight and know you had a hand in something that's withstood the years. And then proud and free from guilt, you'll smile and say, Boys, that's a fence that me and Shorty built. When I was a kid, the most important thing to me was to put together 57 cents to buy a box of 22 long rifle hollow point shells so I could hunt jackrabbits. And sometimes it took several months to get my hands on that much money. And then I had to find somebody going to town to buy the shells for me. So you can understand how excited I got when the manager of the Sanford Ranch, Mr. Whiteside, offered me a job for 50 cents a day to help build fence in that old rough, rocky Canadian river country. Oh, with that kind of money, I could buy a box of shells every other day. But I didn't have the money to buy any gloves, so after the first day, my hands were full of blisters and were bleeding pretty bad, and I complained to Mother that, you know, this job is worth more than 50 cents a day. She said, well, you have two choices. You can ask Mr. Whiteside for a raise, or you can quit. And if he doesn't think the job you're doing is worth a raise, then you still have two choices. You can quit, or you can work your tail off and do a good job like you agreed to do when you hired on. I never forgot that. And the other experience was several years later, I spent the first of five summers on my uncle's farm in northwestern Iowa. And we had a field about, oh, two miles from headquarters farm. And as we were driving along the road, my uncle Floyd looked across the road at the neighbor's field and said, oh, I wish Mr. Cornwall would have those boys plow those corn rows straight. Well, I looked on his side of the road and it looked like a snake had laid out the field. And I looked on our side and the roads were so straight that I could see all the way to the other end of the field. I said, Uncle Floyd, what difference does it make if the corn rows straight? The corn's going to grow anyhow. And I could see the red raise up in his neck all the way to his face. And he said, it makes a difference to me. I want to know that I'm a good farmer. And I want to know that I take pride in my fields and I've done the best job that I can do. That really made an impression on me. 
And today I'm constantly reminded of what John Deere said years ago. I will never put my name on something that is not as good as the best in me. His skin looked like leather. He walked with a limp and talked with a slow Texas drawl. His knuckles were knotted and his right thumb was gone. Said so a stud bit it off late last fall, but hey, we knew he was lying. We'd watched him dally it up. But it ain't healthy to call him a liar. It is Saturday night before the wagon went out and he is setting our new kid on fire. Now we've all heard his stories about places he's been and we think that Jake's kind of strange. He looked over at me and said, I'm schooling this boy about the unwritten laws of the range and the kid was enthralled, kind of like in a trance. Jake sensed that he had a good grip so he straightened up, hitched his pants, took a drink of cold beer, turned around with his hand on his hips and he said, son, a man's brand is his own special mark. He says, this is mine, leave it alone. If you hire out to a man, ride for his brand and protect it like it was your own. Mr. Wagner come here in 1903. This country was sagebrush, mesquite trees, and sand. He carved him this ranch out of blood, sweat, and guts. Be proud that you ride for his brand. If you hired out to string Bob wire, build him a fence. It don't matter if it's four or five strand. Just remember, it was you who asked for the job. Don't bitch when you ride for this brand, because Mr. Wagner don't hold with complainers. And he'll fire one for it and quit. If you don't like our outfit, head down the trail and find a horse that your saddle will fit. But if you get up early, catch your own bronc, and show the boss that you are making a hand, Mr. Wagner will be there to cover your bets as long as you ride for his brand. He said the winter I spent at the Sixes, we had a man at the old Taylor place who rode up on some hiders, a skin and a cow, and squared off at them scamps face to face. Now he could have rode off, never looked back. But he wasn't that kind of man. We found him in Ash Creek, shot all to hell. No Kona Joe died for the brand. We know the old man told a windy or two, like the one about losing his thumb, and No Kona was killed in a bar in Fort Worth by the demons in a bottle of rum. But I got to thinking about what he had said. And the more of it I understand, the more I believe we'd be all better off if more people would ride for the brand. One winter I was at an old camp on the Wagner Ranch in Wilbarger County, Texas with my good friend Don Malone and a bunch of guys. And on a Saturday evening, a bunch of the cowboys came by for supper and a friendly game of penny ante poker. And they were talking about the brand this and the brand that. And then I remember Jimmy said, you know, those are our cattle. The family gets the money, but we're the ones who feed them and doctor them and calve them. They're really our cattle. And I thought, boy, what a great thought. And I looked over at Paul Whitney. Paul had lived in that camp by himself for 41 years. And if anybody ever rode for the brand, it was Paul Whitley. I wrote that poem for Paul and all the other cowboys who ride for the brand. I grew up on the Canadian River in the Texas Panhandle and of course wanted to be a cowboy. And my hero was a fellow named Wilbur Moss. And though he was a pumper in the oil fields, he'd spent his younger years as a cowboy. And he was by far the best shade tree veterinarian that ever lived. He had a remedy for anything that ailed a horse. He showed us how to get out of quicksand and track cattle in the brush and how to get an old cow out of a bog and then run like the Dickens to get out of her way when she got on her feet because likely as not she'd charge you or run right back into the bog or both. <laughs> Regardless of what Hollywood showed us about stampedes, Indian wars, and gunfights, more cowboys lost their lives crossing rivers than in stampedes, Indian wars, and gunfights all put together. When I wrote this song, I drew on my childhood experiences with Wilbur Moss. Back to Texas from a drive to Abilene With the wagon, the remuda, and the crew The Cimarron was boiling red and rising by the hour Was suicide to push the horses through 
Now Cody Bill was pining about his darling Annalise. He left her crying back in San Antonio. The thousand times he'd read the note he carried in his teeth. Cody, darling, won't you hurry home? Now trailing longhorn cattle is a life that's wild and free. And the prairie is a puncher's paradise. But it was dark and deadly in the spring of 83 When the Cimarron was red and on the rise We were at the white playing cards and telling lies When he announced that he was going on We told him he was crazy, he would never make it through But Cody smiled and saddled up the roan then I made him a promise I'd look after Annalise In case he didn't make it through tonight He turned his collar to the wind and bid us adieu And whistling Dixie he rode out of sight Now trailing longhorn cattle is a life that's wild and free But the devil's playing hell in paradise Cause it was dark and deadly in the spring of 83 When the Cimarron was red and on the rise It was nearly seven days before we got across The Rhone was in the shadow of a hill He was skinned from head to toe and covered up with mud But there was not a sign of Cody Bill and I guess we knew that he was gone, but we looked anyhow. We rode for miles and searched on either side. We combed the brush and drug our ropes through every water hole. But Cody Bill had taken his last ride. And I had kept my promise and I married Annalise. And the boy we're raising has his daddy's eyes. Someday I'll tell him all about the spring of 83. When the Cimarron was red and on the rise. Cause it was dark and deadly in the spring of 83. When the Cimarron was red and on the rise. You know, family is the most important factor in my life. I can't imagine life without my brothers and my sister, my mother, my boys, and most of all, my darling wife. They make my world complete. A couple of generations ago, family didn't seem to be as important as it is today because folks were more isolated and had to depend on each other. However, strong family units are the mainstay of our society. Everyone needs family. And when that unity is not found at home, a person finds it someplace else. Hopefully they find it in a church setting, but unfortunately, some find it in gangs and undesirable relationships. I find that people with family support groups tend to be more confident and balanced. And young people starting out together in a lion camp, far from neighbors, seem to form really strong bonds. This is the story of such a couple. She could hear him whistling Dixie long before he came in sight as he rode in through the horse track at the same time every night. They were starting out together, a young cowboy and his bride. In a dugout on the quarter circle wide He could smell her apple cobbler When he topped the canyon rim He 
smiled inside and wondered what she ever saw in him. She had traded dreams of mansions and a pampered way of life for a dugout on the quarter circle wide. They never had much money, they were happy just the same. They were proud to have each other and to share his family name. Their children grew and prospered, we all moved away in time from the dugout on the quarter circle wide. It only drew them closer, they became the best of friends. After 50 years together, they were more than man and wife. They were happy on the quarter circle wide. After all that time as partners, now she faced her toughest step. We buried him last Sunday in his favorite woolen vest. With grandkids gathered round her, she remembered magic times in a dugout on the quarter circle wide. They never had much money, they were happy just the same. They were proud to have each other and to share his family name. Their children grew and prospered, we all moved away in time from the dugout on the quarter circle wide. After 50 years together, they were more than man and wife. They were happy on the quarter circle wide. When I was young, both of my grandfathers were already gone. But my mother's mother was my refuge. When I had a disagreement with mom, I'd go down to grandmother's house and she'd help me work through it. I didn't mean she'd necessarily take my side, but she helped me understand mother's side of the picture so that I'd feel better about it. Everyone needs some place to go where there's neutral ground. And active grandparents provide that refuge and support. I was visiting with a friend of mine when a lady walked up and asked, how's that new grandson? Eddie said, oh boy, he's a dandy. She said, is he talking yet? He said, no. And I know that the first two words he's going to say are mama and daddy, but I'm going to make sure that the first full sentence he makes is I did it because my papa said I could. <laughs> boy, I couldn't get away from him fast enough. I ran to my hotel room and this poem just poured out. It seems like people in all walks of life identify with Paul Paul. I called my granddad Paul Paul. And I loved him more than life, and I tried to copy everything he did. Of course, I was always underfoot or standing in the gate, but if I made him mad, he kept it hidden. When I was two, he bought me my own saddle and a horse. The seat of his old pickup was my bed, and I learned to walk the way he walked and cuss a little bit. See, I hung on every word my papa said. And papa used to brag on me to all the other guys that I would be a champion someday. He taught me how to throw a rope when I was just a kid. I wasn't good enough to make it pay, so when my grandson came along, I recognized the chance to relive memories of my childhood days. My daughter said that papa wasn't very dignified, but I had him call me papa anyways. <laughs> and I taught him how to throw a rope. And he roped everything that came in his imaginary pen. I give him my old saddle and a little spotted horse. And he and I became the best of friends. I probably overdid it. Because he got us both in Dutch when he caught Grandma's rooster in his loop. <laughs> the rooster didn't make it. His grandma threw a fit when he said, Hey, the old bird's tough. He'll make good soup. We've dodged a bullet once or twice, and we've come out okay, though we haven't gotten by with everything. Like early last September, we was branding April calves, the ones too small to work in early spring, and 
I was in the Brandon pen, not paying him no mind, when I caught him in the corner of my eye. He was in that pen afoot and building him a loop. And I chuckled to myself, now this boy's got try. Then much to my surprise and his, he caught a heifer calf that must have weighed at least 400 pounds. <laughs> She jerked that youngster off his feet before I could bat an eye. She quit the herd and took the higher ground, and she drug him through the fresh manure <laughs> up against the fence. His shirt was torn to tatters in the chase. His pants was hanging off his hips, and his boots was full of dirt, but bless his heart, his hat was still in place. <laughs> well, I double-hocked the heifer, and the ground crew stretched her out, and the boy escaped, but Lord, I don't know how. I swear I nearly lost it when he said, hey, shake out your loop and let's go catch ourselves another cow. <laughs> when we was in the barn last night, he asked if he could rope. And I laughed it off and said, I guess you can. See, I never dreamed a four-year-old would have that kind of nerve, and I'm sure that heifer didn't understand. <laughs> I said, uh, let's ride down to the tank and wash your face and hands. What he said just thrilled me through and through. Hey. You don't wash your face and hands till you get in at night. And I want to be a cowboy just like you. <laughs> the mighty warrior had returned victorious from the war. The hand he held was flush and full of spades. And with cow manure on remnants of what used to be a shirt, he expected nothing less than accolades. But unless you fought the battles, and unless you've won the war, Taste of victory sometimes ain't that sweet. See, his mama saw destruction and a bruised and battered boy. <laughs> to her, his hard-won victory spelled defeat. Boy, he reveled in his glory as he told his mama the tale. He said, that heifer run right in my noose. Then I worked around the pen till Papa caught her by the heels. <laughs> then we burned her hide before we cut her loose. <laughs> She screamed, why did you do that? As she grabbed him by the arm, I raised this girl. And boy, can she get mean. <laughs> Before I let him in too deep, I'll toss the kid a line. But right now, it's best that I ain't heard or seen. Because we're talking about a cyclone and a giant hissy fit if she reacted like I thought she would. But I popped the buttons off my shirt when he looked up and said, I did it because my papa said I could. <laughs> Family is important. And there's a young lady with us who knows all about family. And she knows all about a pawpaw. She called him Grandpap. Reba, would you join me? How you doing? Have a seat. Okay. Right. Oh, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Now, I want to hear about Grandpap. Okay, well, my grandpap is my daddy's daddy, like as you know, and he's a very funny character. He was a, a widower at, the, at, you know, pretty early in life, but he always took care of us kids. Wherever we were up in the mountains, gathering cattle, daddy would always say, Oh, hey, you kids, I... Well, we'd never hear a word he said. And we'd all look to Grandpap. What did Daddy say? What were we supposed to do? And Grandpap would go over the instructions thoroughly, step by step, and let each one of us know what to do. So if it wasn't for Grandpap, us kids probably would still be up in that 8,000 acres in Chalky, Oklahoma, lost. <laughs> how about your grandmother? You and I have talked about your grandmother. You've told me some stories about how she influenced your life. Well, Grandma was our only grandma because Daddy's mama passed away before Alice, my oldest sister, was born. So Mama's mama... Grandma Smith was a very spiritual woman. We lost her several years ago, but uh, she taught us kids a lot about spirituality. Took us to church as often as she could, but the, the things that we learned were up on the pond dam or on the creek bank or out picking tomatoes or working the garden. And she'd teach us the, the things about morals and spirituality and what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do, but in story. And we never knew it was a lesson when she was giving it to us. <laughs> but you knew there was a, a definite line between right and wrong, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And you have a tremendous work ethic. 
And I know that because I've watched you for all these years and been through a lot of things with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are determined, that you do not mind working day and night to accomplish what you know needs to be accomplished. And where did that come from? Well, I, it's always been around me. Mom and Daddy worked hard and, and us kids worked hard. I, I don't know many kids that uh, nowadays that were you know expected to work. Uh, people would ask me, how'd you learn how to ride? And I said, well, Daddy threw us on the horse and, and said, get in there and find some cattle. And uh, not too long ago, a good friend of mine went down to help Daddy work cattle and he said, can you ride? And she said, well, no. He said, well, can you h hang on? <laughs> and so that was her riding lesson. So uh, we were just always there as four kids were pretty much the hired hands along with Louis Sandman and Grandpa to go up and help Daddy find the cattle and bring them down the pens and work cattle or ship them out. So your parents taught you a solid work ethic. Definitely. And when you were growing up, your daddy rodeoed and you went with him a lot. Mm -hmm. All you kids did. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you tell this story a hundred times, but I want you to tell everybody else how you kids would sing and how you while away the time on those long hours in the back of that car going from rodeo to rodeo. Well, Daddy didn't have very much patience at all. And with four kids in the back seat wrestling and fighting and arguing, we always knew that his patience was just about to explode and wear very thin when his arm went up on the back of the seat. Because the next step was going to be start pinching and finding somebody to get a hold of to tell us to be quiet. So he was getting on his nerves. So Mama knew when that breaking point was getting close, and we didn't have a radio in the car. We barely had armrest. And so to break to pass the time, what we'd do is Mama would get us kids to sing. And she would teach us harmony, and she'd get one of us to sing lead, and then the other would sing harmony. And then she'd let this one sing lead while the other one sang harmony. And we'd sing song like, uh, Please, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go because we was up in Wyoming and she thought that was kind of a history lesson too. And since Susie, my little sister, her name was Susie, so since she was always in the car too, we'd sing the old Everly Brothers song, Wake Up Little Susie. <laughs> She's always sleeping. <laughs> Daddy'd always say, get up and look down the road. You might learn something. From all those experiences, how do you think this helps you on the Broadway stage with Annie Get Your Gun? Oh my gosh. Well, Mom always taught us, when you start something, you finish it. And so, a long time ago, when I first got started in this business, I, I would say, oh, Mama, I, I don't want to go do this, or it's a four-hour dance, and, and it's going to be a smoky club, and I'm, I'm allergic to smoke, I'm dreading it. She said, look, you can do anything for four hours, and it'll be over, and we'll just have fun tomorrow. So just go do it, because you told them you'd be there. Okay. So I have learned to, when I, I know I've got a hard job to do, I give it my best, and every time, every night before or afternoon when that's, that curtain starts to go up, I say to myself, this is going to be the best I can do, and I have more fun doing it that way. You know, Reba, they say that the West was tough on men and dogs and hell on women and <laughs> What I've heard, I believe that. I sometimes wonder how those ladies kept their sanity because they often went months without the pleasure of another lady's company. Don't you reckon that was terribly lonesome? I know it would be, absolutely. Because you know ladies get tired of talking about horses and cattle and mountain lions. <laughs> <laughs> they want to talk about soft and nice things. Uh -huh. And somewhere out on the plains of the panhandles of Texas, Oklahoma, or western Kansas or eastern New Mexico, lived a lady who wrote little sonnets on pieces of linen. And then she'd tie them with ribbons to tumbleweeds and turn them loose in the wind. And the cowboys had found them, find them out on that vast prairie. You know, that must have eased her loneliness a little bit to know that somewhere, sometime, she had contact with the outside world. And also, can you imagine what that meant to that cowboy oh, who man. found that sonnet and that thing written on that piece of linen, evidently in a lady's hand, so far away from home and the pleasure of a lady's company? Well, Louis Lemoore took that story. They don't know who that lady was, but he took the story and he wrote a novel about it. And then Sam Elliott and Catherine Ross made a movie called Conagher. It was a good movie. Mm -hmm. But my brother Danny and Ace Ford and I like to think this is the way it happened. Okay. Boys. On a fence line north of Esteline, strangest sight I'd ever seen was a note tied with a ribbon to a rolling tumbleweed. 
Rise us, tossed his head and shied. We got caught up on the wire. Stepped down from my saddle horse and gave that note a read. Lines that were written in a fair woman's hand told of her life and the loss of her man. Knits her heart and her hopes she has cast in the wind. And it's me, the old tumbleweed chose Fine Red River Road By the time I'd built a fire that night I'd memorized every line And felt the silent teardrops That had fallen on that note When I heard a lonesome cow cry It was then I realized Rose and this old cowboy have been too long alone. Lines that were written in a fair woman's hand told of her life and the loss of her man. It's her heart and her hopes she has cast in the wind, and it's me that old tumbleweed chose. Fine. Faced with cedar logs Was a woman in a cotton dress The color of the sod She said the man she loved had died And so to keep her occupied She tied notes to the tumbleweeds Trusted them to God Lines that were written In a fair woman's hand Told of her life And the loss of her it's her heart and her hopes she has cast in the wind, and it's me that old tumbleweed chose. Fine Red River Road, in a cedar cabin neath the canyon wall, we light a fire and watch the snowflakes. I'm glad it's me that old tumbleweed chose Fine Red River Road I love my Red River Road Oh, that's pretty. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the visit. Enjoy that. Miss Reba McIntyre. Thanks, Reba. Visiting with my friend Dwayne Johnson one day in Wichita Falls, he told me the story of how his grandmother came to Texas in a covered wagon. They camped out on the prairie where the trail herds went north to Kansas, and one day a cowpuncher gave her a calf that was not going to survive on the trail. Next spring, her daddy traded that calf for a red cedar trunk. That trunk is still in his family. I tried to imagine what might be in the trunk as I wrote this poem. They came in a wagon from St. Joe, Missouri. Grandmother was seven years old. And I remember she said she walked most of the way through the mud and the rain and the cold, and she saw the Comanche. They came into camp, not the savage she had seen in her dreams. They were ragged and pitiful, hungry and cold, begging for salt pork and beans. They staked out a claim in the cross timbers break where the big herds went north to the rail. And one day a cowpuncher gave her a calf too young to survive on the trail. Their old Jersey cow gave more milk than they needed so the calf grew up healthy and strong. She staked him that fall in the grass with a creek and pampered him all winter long. In April, her daddy rode into Fort Worth with her calf on the end of his rope. And he traded her prize for a red cedar trunk that she's filled full of memories and hopes. I found grandmother's trunk hidden under a bed in a back room where she used to sleep. And I've spent the whole morning reliving her life through the trinkets that she fought to keep. There's the old family Bible, yellowed and worn. 
On the first page was her family tree. She had traced it clean back to the New England coast, and the last entry she made was me. I unfolded a beautiful star pattern quilt. In the corner, she had cross-stitched her name. I wonder how many children it kept safe and warm from the cold of those West Texas plains. And a tattered old picture that said, Mom, I love you. And though faded, there's a young soldier's face and a medal of honor the government sent when he died in a faraway place. A cradle board covered with porcupine quills that was traded for salt pork and beans was laying on top of a ribbon that read, Ford County Rodeo Queen. Dried flowers pressed in a book full of poems and a card with this message engraved to my darling wife on our 25th year and some old stamps my grandfather saved. Of course, there were pictures of all of her folks. They sure did look proper and prim, but I reckon if they were to come back to life, we'd look just as funny to them. You know, grandmother's life seemed so simple and slow. Her world started changing too soon. See, she heard the first radio, saw the first car, and then lived to see man on the moon. Life on this planet is still marching on, and I hope that my grandchildren see my side of life through the trinkets I've saved, the way grandmother's trunk does for me. While doing research for a book, I gathered a lot of pictures of old sod houses in Kansas and Nebraska and on the plains of Texas and Oklahoma. And I noticed that there was always a wicker cage hanging beside the door of each of those old soddies. And I had no idea what they were until I read an account of a lady who homesteaded in Nebraska. She said that the cages held yellow canaries. And for a long time, historians thought that the women brought the birds west for their song. But she said, no, the prairie was full of songbirds like the dove and the meadowlark and the quail and the plover and the curlew and the wren and the thrush. But that about nine months out of the year, the only color in their lives was that one small yellow bird. Everything else in their world was brown. The clothes, the ground, the sky most of the time. And so until the sunflowers bloomed in the spring, their world was fairly dreary except for the yellow bird. And can you imagine what that little speck of color meant to a lady way out on that vast prairie. In a wagon pulled by oxen from their home in Tennessee, they came all the way to Kansas filled with youthful hopes and dreams. She had packed her grandma's china in a crate behind the seat. A newborn child lay sleeping in a cradle as they drove, she sang the old songs Mama taught her as a child. Took her mind off Indians and dangers of the wild. And on the wagon seat beside her was a tiny wicker cake. And inside a yellow songbird, the only color in the sea. The north winds howled in winter across. The summer sun dried up the earth, and then the dust storms came. She worked beside him through the day, alone at night she cried. She almost gave up trying on the day the songbird died. They built a home of prairie sod, they sowed the fields of seed. For a while the plains of Kansas gave her all she thought she'd need. Then wheat fields turned to fine brown dust across the naked plain. Days turned into weeks and months without a sign of rain. Her dress was brown, the sky was brown, the wind was all she heard. The only color was one small yellow bird. Then long before the season brought sunflowers and the rain, she wrapped her world inside herself and almost went insane. 
it looked as though she might have gone to somewhere dark and cold. And I wrapped my arms around her neck and begged her not to go. Then somewhere deep within her soul, I saw her spirit rise. And fight the devastation of the day somber died. She almost gave a try on the day somber died. In the days of the trail drives, the mesquite and cedar had not yet crossed the Red River. So when they swam the herds over into Indian Territory, all they saw was a solid sea of grass as far as the eye could see. Weren't any high hills off out in the distance, no big trees on the horizon. So the only way the boss knew to start the herd off the bed ground the next morning was the direction the cook had pointed the wagon tongue. If he could see it, he always pointed it to the North Star. I hired out to Colonel Slaughter Driving steers to Abilene Green and wet behind the ears A kid of 17 Though I was raised in Texas I was not a seasoned hand So I took the job of Hootland the Coosie's right hand man. On the Yano West Dakota, all you see is endless plain. You dread the sound of thunder, there's no shelter from the rain. And our Coosie did a strange thing when the evening meal was done. He'd wait until the stars come out, then move the wagon tongue. He said, Son, there ain't no landmarks on these wide rolling plains. Ain't no trees or mountains, so each day it looks the same. But you'll never lose direction, and you know just where you are. You'll always point that wagon tongue toward the old North Star. Then out beyond the Cimarron, one cold and stormy night, I watched the cattle stampede in the lightning's eerie light. Took several days to round them up, get them settled down. We followed with the wagon through the soft and muddy ground. As we pushed the herd across the plain, had no way to know that we had drifted way off course toward New Mexico. And then the night the stars came out, his theory stood the test. Abilene's up north of us, but we were headed west. He said, son, there ain't no landmarks on these wide rolling plains. Ain't no trees or mountains, so each day it looks the same. But you'll never lose direction, and you'll know just where you are. You'll always point that wagon tongue toward the old North Star. My life has been a fool. My hair is turning gray, and I've seen a lot of sunshine, but I've seen some cloudy days. For a while I wandered aimlessly, and I still wear the scars, but I didn't point my wagon tongue for that old North Star. Cause life is like a grassy sea, the trail ain't always plain. One may lead to pleasure, and another lead to pain. You'll never lose direction and you'll know just where you are. You'll always point your wagon tongue toward the old North Star. No, you'll never lose direction and you'll know just where you are. You'll always point your wagon tongue toward your own North Star.
probably the most important right in our society is our ability to individually own land, utilize it while we're here, and pass it on to future generations. We must at all costs retain our private range lands and preserve and perpetuate the lifestyle of the American cowboy. He is, above all others, an environmentalist and a conservationist. No one loves the land and appreciates its value more than the cowboy. I've kicked up the hidden mesquite roots and rocks from the place where I spread out my bed. And I'm laying here looking at a sky full of stars with my hands folded up neath my head. Tonight, there's a terrible pain in my heart. Like a knife, it cuts jagged and deep. This evening, the windmiller brought me the word that my granddaddy died in his sleep. So I saddled my gray horse and rode out to a hill where when I was a youngster of nine, my grandfather said to me, son, this is ours. It's yours, your daddy's, and mine. He said, my granddaddy settled here after the war. That new tank's where his house used to be. He wanted to cowboy and live in the West, come to Texas from East Tennessee. And a longhorn were wild as a deer in them breaks. With a long rope, he caught him a few, and with the money he made from trailing them north, he proved up this homestead for you. When the railroad got closer, we built the first fence where the river runs through the east side. Then when I was a button, they built these corrals. And that winter, my granddaddy died. He said, my father took over and bought up more range. With purebreds, he improved our stock and windmills. Looked like they grew out of the ground. And that land got as hard as a rock. And during that dust bowl, we barely hung on. The wind tried to blow us away. But it seemed that the Lord took a liking to us. He kept turning up ways we could stay. As my father grew older, he gave me more rain. We'd paid for most all of this land. By the time he went on, I was running more cows. And your daddy was my right-hand man. His eyes got real cloudy, took off in a trot, and I watched as he rode out of sight. And though I was a child, I knew I was special, and I'm feeling that same way tonight. Not many years later, my daddy was killed on a ship in the South China Sea. And for 20 odd years now, we've made this ranch work. Two cowboys, my granddad and me. And now that he's gone, things are certain to change. And I reckon that's how it should be, but five generations have called this ranch home. And I promise it won't end with me because I've got a little one home in a crib. And when he's old enough that he'll understand, from the top of that hill, I'll show him his ranch. Because like me, he was born to this land. The land. There's nothing else. The land ties the entire American community together. It binds families. It provides the foodstuffs that make this the greatest country in the history of mankind. To the cowman, the land supports the grass, his sole reason for being here in the first place. I'm reminded of a piece of an old Daglish poem that says, east were the dead kings and remembered sepulchers, west was the grass. The buffalo were on the plains because of the grass, the Indian was there because of the buffalo. And then the grass supported the longhorn. And the cowboy is here today because of the cattle. Land is passed from generation to generation. And though its use may change with the passage of time, its value remains the same. Private ownership of land is the single most important element in the progression and security of a free and independent society. Thanks for riding along with us. We hope we taught you something about the cowboy you didn't know or maybe brought back an old memory. Either way, we should all remember that regardless of how fast-paced or high-tech our world becomes, the code of the West still applies with its values of honesty, integrity, loyalty, family dedication, 
commitment, and work ethic. It's still important to honor your commitments and take responsibility for your own actions. May the wind always be at your back. And may the good Lord take a liking to each and every one of you. Especially you, my dear friend Reba. Thanks. Adios. This program is made possible through the generosity of the Code of the West Foundation, believing in a set of common sense values, working for what you get, helping your neighbors, taking care of your family, and having your handshake and word be your bond.